we have been discussing uh, analysis of a two dimensional uh, continuum and three dimensional continuum. So, we will continue with that discussion and uh, we expect to uh, close that discussion in this lecture and we will start discussing about uh, problems of plate bending and uh, shell elements. And this is the uh, topics for today's uh, lecture. So, in the previous class we considered three dimensional elements uh, and derived the structural matrices uh, rectangular hexahedron, isoparametric hexahedron and tetrahedron elements uh, and we worked out a simple problem also. Now, we will continue with that. Uh, so, this is a 8 noded uh, element with 3 degrees of freedom per node, so 24 degrees of freedom. Uh, this is isoparametric hexahedron element for 3 dimensional solids. Now, in today's class what we will do is we want to consider um, problems of uh, uh, again a kind of a 2 dimensional approximation to solids of revolution, solids which uh, we obtain by uh, revolving around one of the axes. So, that uh, kind of uh, uh, objects uh, geometry is well treated uh, using uh, cylindrical polar coordinates. So, we will quickly review the equations of elasticity in cylindrical polar coordinates. So, the coordinate system here is um, this is a Cartesian coordinate system x, y, z and in uh, cylindrical polar coordinates we have r, theta and z. So, this is uh, this is the position vector r I mean coordinate r, this is angle theta and this is height is z. Now, the relationship between Cartesian and uh, cylindrical polar coordinates is shown here x is r cos theta, y is r sin theta and z is same as z. So, in cylindrical polar coordinates the independent coordinates are r theta, z and t and stress components we denote as sigma r r, sigma theta theta, sigma z z, sigma r theta, sigma z theta and sigma r z. Strain component correspondingly have the similar notation epsilon r r, epsilon theta theta, epsilon z z and so on and so forth. The displacement components are denoted by u r, u theta, u z and we will agree to call them as simply as u v w. And the body forces uh, uppercase f r, f, uh, f theta and f z. So, <coughs> how this uh, you know this uh, axisymmetric solids are produced. Suppose you have a generator plane with area A and suppose if it revolves around axis Z it produces an object like this. So, these uh, the, the focus of our discussion is on studying this type of objects. So, in this case uh, we, we need to model only this generator plane uh, and we can conduct the complete the analysis for this object. Now, with that in mind let us uh, review the equations of elasticity. Uh, we have seen these equations in Cartesian coordinates. So, the equilibrium equations uh, on upon making uh, the using this transformation uh, we can show that uh, it gets transformed to uh, the 3 equilibrium equations are here and uh, the strain displacement relations again uh, gets modified and they uh, are shown here and the stress strain relation also uh, gets modified and we are assuming the body is isotropic, uh, linearly elastic and isotropic. <coughs> so, uh, the kind of objects that we are studying uh, here have a rotational symmetry about an axis. So, z axis is the axis of symmetry and there is a rotational symmetry about that. This type of structures as I was mentioning briefly in the previous uh, lecture are encountered widely in engineering. Uh, this is a cross section of a nuclear reactor um, structure. You can see this outer shell, uh, it is a cylindrical, uh, it is a cross section in plan it is circular. So, you can see that these um, shells have uh, rotational symmetry about the uh, vertical axis. Now, what exactly uh, is the consequence of uh, uh, this uh, symmetry on equations of velocity. So, the objects that we are considering uh, are characterized by geometry with these features. Uh, they are three dimensional axis symmetric solids, they are not necessarily prismatic, not necessarily thin or thick. 
So, these two conditions if you recall were necessary for implementing plane stress and plane strain models we are relaxing that. The loads the surface tractions are independent of theta they are only functions of r and z and similarly body forces there is no body force in the theta direction uh, and the other body forces in r and z directions are independent of theta. Under these assumptions uh, the displacements in the uh, theta direction will be 0 and the other two displacements u and w uh, u in r direction w in z direction will be independent of theta. So, this is the postulate on displacements the material itself we are going to assume linear homogeneous elastic and isotropic. So, as a consequence of this what happens now we have v equal to 0 u is independent of theta w is independent of theta. So, the implications of this on strains if you look at epsilon r r is dou u by dou r it will be non 0 epsilon theta theta is u by r plus dou v by dou theta now dou v by dou theta is 0 because v is 0 and this will be simply u by r which is not 0 epsilon z z of course uh, derivative of w with respect to z is non 0 epsilon r z again uh, it involves derivative of u with respect to z and w with respect to r that would be non 0 but the other shear strengths epsilon r theta dou u by dou theta is 0 because u is independent of theta dou v by dou r is 0 because v is 0 similarly this is 0 therefore this shear strain becomes 0 similarly we can show that epsilon z theta is also 0. So, there are 4 non 0 strain components now uh, we can now look at the constitutive laws uh, we have sigma r r given by this uh, it is again non 0 uh, sigma theta theta is non 0 sigma z z is non 0 sigma theta z is 2 g epsilon theta z but epsilon theta z is 0 therefore this is 0 sigma z r is uh, 2 g into epsilon z r epsilon z r uh, is not 0 therefore this stress will be non 0 but the other shear stress sigma r theta will be 0 because epsilon r theta is 0. So, now we have 4 stress components 4 strain components and 2 displacement components. So, there are 8 uh, unknowns and we need now um, 10 equations. So, these are strain displacement relations 4 in number this is stress strain relations 4 in number now the other 2 equations are obtained from the uh, equilibrium equations. Now, these are the equilibrium equations uh, whatever I showed here are rep, uh, replicated here except that the terms which are 0 are now indicated in red. So, consequently what happens uh, one of the equilibrium equation is satisfied identically and we are left with 2 equilibrium equations. So, the summary is we have 2 unknown displacements 4 strain components 4 stress components which are non-zero and unknown therefore, there are 10 unknowns we have 2 equilibrium equations 4 strain displacement equations and 4 stress strain relation. So, these can be solved uh, in the classical theory of velocity there are ways of introducing a stress function and uh, developing solutions based on uh, this set of 10 equations. Now, <coughs> our objective is to develop uh, the um, finite element model for this. So, with that in view we will just see now the uh, strain uh, we will assemble them in a 4 cross 1 vector as shown here epsilon r r epsilon z z and epsilon theta theta and the strain display they are related to displacement through these relations after introducing all the simplifications resulting from assumptions of axisymmetry of geometry loads and boundary conditions. So, uh, the <coughs> element field variables will be u r z w r z I am not showing t explicitly uh, it can be introduced subsequently t is the time. So, right now I am not doing that uh, stress will be these are the 4 stress components. So, we have 4 strain components related to displacement uh, 2 displacement components which are not known 4 stress components which are related to uh, strain through this and using this relation they in turn get related to displacements. Now, D is the uh, matrix of uh, that relates stress and strain uh, uh, this is for an isotropic linearly elastic material uh, this is the uh, D matrix E is Young's modulus nu is Poisson's ratio. Now, <coughs> we want to now develop uh, a finite element model for this now we will start with a triangular element. So, it has 3 nodes and at each node there are 2 degrees of freedom 
uh, shown here and this these uh, 1 2 3 are the nodes and the nodal coordinates are r1 z1 r2 z2 and r3 z3 this is z axis this is our r axis now <coughs> So, the nodal degrees of freedom are um, u1, u2, w1, w2 uh, sorry u1, w1, u2, w2, u3, w3. So, consequently we interpolate the field variables within the element in terms of these nodal coordinates nodal degrees of freedom using this interpolation form. We have encountered this triangular uh, element earlier in the context of plane stress problems so the same uh, shape functions will be uh, relevant here also. So, we write this as u w is n into u e u this vector is 2 cross 1 n is 2 cross 6 and u e is 6 cross 1. So, based on this I write now the expression for uh, kinetic energy where m e is the mass matrix given by h rho n transpose n d a naught. <coughs> so, now uh, we want to uh, express the strain in terms of nodal displacements for that we first write the uh, strain displacement relations uh, for polar coordinates it is written in this form uh, this is the actually the strain displacement relations we want to write it in this form and uh, for u w I introduce n into u e and this this matrix into the matrix of shape functions is our b matrix. So, this is 4 cross 6 and this is 6 cross 1. So, that this is 4 cross 1. Now, based on this the strain energy is given by half u e transpose into the stiffness matrix u e and this stiffness matrix is given by uh, h into integral over a, a naught b transpose d b d a naught. So, this is the uh, this development parallels what we have done earlier for plane elements plane stress elements. <coughs> So, we can go ahead and use the uh, shape functions and evaluate if you recall for the triangular element we knew the shape functions uh, they were linear functions and uh, we were able to evaluate the mass and stiffness matrix exactly. So, I am not going to develop those elements, but I am just giving a few steps so that uh, if necessary you can proceed and evaluate these matrices. Now, we can consider now a <coughs> uh, a slight relaxation on the requirements that we spelt out for analyzing uh, axisymmetric solids. Suppose if we consider the situation in which the body is axisymmetric it is supported axisymmetrically, but the applied loads are not axisymmetric. So, the problem would still be three dimensional can we solve this problem uh, using two dimensional models is the question. Now, since the system is linear uh, a material is linear and we are assuming strain displacement relations to be linear principle of superposition holds good. So, the proposition here is that we will expand the applied loads surface tractions in a Fourier series uh, in theta ok. So, if we applied uh, the uh, lower case f r and f z are the um, surface tractions uh, I expand them in Fourier series as shown here and cosine terms will produce uh, behavior which, which is symmetric about theta equal to 0 and sine terms will produce behavior which is anti symmetric about theta equal to 0. Now, uh, the and f theta uh, it is a body force in theta direction uh, will be expanded like this I am assuming now that there is a surface traction in theta direction also not body force this. Now, using the orthogonality property of sin and cosine functions we can evaluate these Fourier coefficients uh, f r n f z n and f r n bar f z n bar f theta n and f theta n bar. So, this is straightforward. this is a simple application of uh, Fourier's uh, logic. Uh, so, for n equal to 0 we get this and for uh, n equal to uh, 1 uh, 2 etcetera the, the sin and cosine terms etcetera are given here. Now, the whole idea the idea of uh, this um, uh, formulation is we will develop one finite element model for each of these terms and we will produce a, an uh, ensemble of models and uh, uh, we will synthesize the re total response uh, by summing over the responses for each of the you know models each one corresponding to one component of these excitations. So, how to do that we will just quickly see a few steps. Now, since surface tractions are expanded in Fourier series 
we will also expand the displacements in the Fourier series. So this is written as nu n sin n theta plus nu n bar sin n theta. Uh, this is V and uh, UV is uh, expanded in this form. Now the strain displacement relations. This is the strain displacement. Relations. Now we are considering the three-dimensional uh, strain displacement relations. Uh, uh, what we do is we split the strain vector into uh, a component with four cross one elements and a two cross one element. If the body is axisymmetric, this will be zero. Uh, this is uh, uh, anyway it will be uh, present even for axisymmetric uh, solids or uh, general solids as well. Now stress strain relations uh, we will write separately for uh, these four components and for these two components. Uh, they are not coupled in a, a linear isotropic elastic material those things will not be coupled. So sigma 1 I write, write it as D1 epsilon 1 sigma 1 is these four components RR theta theta ZZ RZ this is given by this in, in terms of the strains epsilon RR epsilon theta theta epsilon ZZ and epsilon RZ. Similarly sigma 2 is given uh, con consist of the sharing strain sigma r theta and sigma z theta and it is related to epsilon r theta and epsilon z theta through this uh, transformation. Now the expression for energies this is the kinetic energy this is the strain energy the strain energy has two parts this is, an, uh, this is a, a breakup that is done to uh, facilitate computation uh, it is not in, there is no physical arguments for this now and similarly the virtual work done can also be written in this form. Now what is the uh, implication of using Fourier decomposition on displacement components on the evaluation of energies. So now uh, we can uh, carry out integration with respect to theta uh, this, this was over the volume element now on theta if you carry uh, you can calculate the uh, you can carry out the integration and we get these expressions. Now Te the total element kinetic energy is taken to be summation of uh, kinetic energy for various Fourier components given the orthogonality of these uh, um, basis functions sinusoidal basis functions and the fact that system is linear there would not be any coupling uh, between the energy contributions from different uh, Fourier terms. So this therefore I get uh, if I sum all the kinetic energies for over the Fourier coefficients I get the total kinetic energy and similar statement is valid for this also. Now we have to consider uh, the nature of these terms for n equal to 0 and n not equal to 0 separately for n not equal to 0 this is the expression for kinetic energy. Now if we now use and similarly this is strain energy and this is the work done. So uh, th this is written for nth component in the Fourier expansion. So this is also written for the nth component in the Fourier uh, expansion similarly work virtual work done also uh, this is a contribution from nth component in the Fourier series. Here uh, this integration we get a RS DS this is surface traction um, the work done by the surface traction this RS is actually value of R on the surface S. Now the axisymmetric motion uh, that is n equal to 0 sorry the n equal to 0 term needs to be handled separately and it has axisymmetric and anti uh, symmetric motion uh, this is pure torsion and this is this consists of these terms that is n equal to 0 is done separately. Now the, uh, the idea of uh, this decomposition is each one of these problems can be tackled as a two dimensional problem in uh, you know analysis. So you can develop a two dimensional finite element model for each of these uh, terms separately. So uh, that can be uh, you know systematically done I am not going to get into the details I am just giving you the uh, uh, you know, main idea on how to do that. So the motion corresponding to each harmonic is determined separately and each component problem can be solved as a two dimensional problem uh, and we can develop finite element model for each of these component problems because if you see now the structure of these energies uh, they resemble that uh, resemble what we have handled earlier. So this is uh, some simple ideas associated with analysis of axisymmetric solids. Now the next uh, uh, part of our discussion we will now move on to uh, problems of a plate bending. <coughs> so this figure explains the basic nomenclature that we use in the study of plates. So here is a rectangular plate, plate is a object which is bounded by two faces 
T is the thickness and this plane is called the middle plane and this is a, this is the least lateral dimension and this is the thickness. Th this surface is called the edge, this top surface is called the face. Now, a, in a um, <coughs> problem like this the loads can act transverse to the middle plane or in line with the middle plane. The problem of loads acting in line with the middle plane can be uh, tackled using plane stress models. Whereas, the question now is how to treat the analysis of this uh, type of uh, structures under transverse load that is known as plate action. So, this if uh, action where the structure deforms due to in plane loads is called membrane action. So, membrane action can be analyzed using plane stress elements. Now, the bending action is due to transverse loads uh, this is what we are going to discuss in today's lecture. Now, there are a few uh, assumptions that we build a theory for behavior of these plates by making few assumptions. So, I will run through these assumptions. So, in this slide there is um, two columns here the first column states the assumption and the second column has few commentaries on uh, these assumptions. So, what we will do is first we will run through the assumptions and then discuss the uh, consequences and uh, comments on that. So, the first is material of the plate is elastic homogeneous and isotropic. The body is initially flat that is the next assumption. The thickness of the plate is small the thickness of the plate is small compared to its other dimensions. The smallest lateral dimension of the body is at least 10 times larger than the thickness. Next we make certain assumptions on magnitudes of deflections. The deflections are small as compared with the plate thickness. For example, the maximum deflection is taken to lie between t by 10 to t by 5. Uh, this is this, this range can be viewed as limits for validity of thin plate theory. The slope of the deflected middle surface uh, is small compared to unity. Uh, terms the, the consequence of that terms with squares of the slopes can be neglected. Then there is no deformation of the middle surface during bending. Then the deformations are such that straight lines initially normal to the middle plane remain straight and normal to the middle plane. The thickness of the plate remains unaltered okay and finally, the stresses normal to the middle surface are negligible uh, are of negligible, negligible order of magnitude. So, these are the basic assumptions we make we can quickly run through uh, the, the uh, implications of these assumptions many of these are assumptions are also made in analysis of beams. Uh, so, some of the comments that I am going to make may be uh, valid in that context also. So, let us see now the material of the plate is elastic homogeneous and isotropic this is not a fundamental assumption it is not a basic requirement to develop a plate theory. We can develop alternative theories which relax these assumptions um, for example, inelasticity and anisotropy may be desired for economic designs and optimal usage of material. For example, in problems of earthquake engineering uh, we want to uh, design structures to behave inelastically in a controlled manner. Similarly, in composites uh, and RCC etcetera we introduce anisotropy to uh, uh, you know enhance the performance of the uh, structures structural material. So, this is a uh, simplifying assumption if necessary these assumptions can be relaxed. Now, the body is initially flat this is valid for plate theory in the theory of shells the body can be initially curved. So, for a plate theory this is uh, this is uh, required then the thickness of the plate is small compared to its other dimensions. Uh, the smallest lateral dimension of the body is at least 10 times larger than its thickness. Now, this is a fundamental assumption this is what defines what a plate is. So, T being much less than or equal to L uh, T is the thickness being uh, much less than the least lateral dimension is the most fundamental assumption from a physical point of view. If this condition is not satisfied we are not talking about plates ok. So, the typical range for T by L is uh, this 0 0.001 to 0 0.4. If it is of the order of point not not 1 we can use a membrane theory like a string uh, you know a two dimensional analog of a string. If, if it is in the range of about point 0.1 thin plate theory can be used 
uh, if it is in the range of 0.4 then we need to use thick plate thin. So this is one of the important assumptions. <coughs> The deflections are small as compared with the plate thickness and other descriptions given here. Now this enables uh, us to write equations uh, you know to form the equations now can be formulated in terms of initial undeformed geometry. Products of deformation parameters can be neglected. Then validity actually if you make these assumptions and carry out a computation if you are interested you can test the validity of these assumptions by actually performing the calculations of uh, squares of displacement terms and uh, products of slopes and things like that uh, in the course of solutions we can really verify for example the terms that we have ignored in the strain displacement relations we can compare with the terms that we have retained and see whether they are indeed small or not. So it is possible to post, uh, posteriori uh, kind of check if these assumptions are met or not if these conditions are violated we can develop a geometrically non-linear theory by retaining all other assumptions all other assumptions means uh, the earlier assumptions okay and the, some of the things that to follow as magnitude of the as admi admissible displacement increases the tendency for material non-linear behavior needs to be taken into account see if you are inclu including uh, non-linear strain displacement relations the, yeah, and if the displacements are large the material has a tendency to enter into inelastic regimes uh, as far as stress strain relations are concerned. So that also has to be borne in mind. Next there is no deformation of the middle surface during bending this actually helps us to define the neutral plane and it is not valid uh, when in plane loads are also present it, it is not valid for large deformations. Then the deformations are such that straight lines initially normal to the middle plane remain straight and normal to the middle plane the thickness of the plate remains unaltered. Now this, this is not going to be uh, you know in a scientific sense uh, satisfied for example uh, lines in, in which are initially normal to the middle plane will not remain normal to the middle plane after deformation they may not remain straight and thickness uh, need not uh, remain unaltered but the point is uh, the resulting errors uh, in the kind of situation that we are considering are negligible for thin plates that is the uh, range of applicability of the theory that we are developing the transfer shearing strains acting on planes normal to the middle plane are neglected the assumptions can be relaxed these assumptions are also not fundamental you can relax these assumptions uh, uh, and we for example while discussing Euler Bernoulli beam theory if we include a shear deformation contribution of a shear deformation to transverse deflection we saw that we can develop an alternate theory known as Timoshenko beam theory. So the assumptions that we are discussing here for the in the context of plate are the Kirchhoff law uh, you know assumptions. So uh, some if you relax some of these assumptions there are other theories like Mindlin plate theory uh, which uh, allows for uh, thick plates and a contribution of shear deformations to uh, tran transverse deflections. So there are further higher order plate theories uh, which are available in the uh, existing literature. So the point is that uh, this assumption can be relaxed and we can develop alternative theories. So the thickness of the plate remains unaltered the uh, consequences normal strains are neglected the stresses normal to the middle surface are of negligible order of magnitude this again valid for small values of T by L uh, the plate thickness does not change during deformation not valid in the vicinity of concentrated loads uh, uh, <laughs> and as the value of the thickness increases uh, this assumption is not uh, valid. Now what is the meaning of this assumption the deformations are such that straight lines initially normal to the middle plane remain straight and normal to the middle plane. So this is uh, I have shown the undeformed uh, cross section of a plate and Mn is the uh, line which is actually it is a surface normal to the plane of this uh, screen uh, which this is a middle plane this is a middle plane and the Mn is at a 90 degrees to the middle plane this is before deformation now after deformation so we can sketch this so M A, the middle surface this is uh, in according to our assumption M bar N bar is where M N goes in the deformed geometry and this angle remains as 90 degree that is what we are saying. Now 
it, it is possible that uh, it remains straight but it may be at an angle for example uh, the mn may be like this okay so here there is a shear deformation this angle alpha okay here there is no shear deformation but still this surface is remaining uh, plain or this line is uh, remaining a straight but it can also deform in a more uh, you know nonlinear way across the thickness so then in which case we need higher order theories uh, uh, to be developed so what we are doing in thin plate theory is this situation in midline plate theory we can use this situation so when it comes to computation of uh, kinetic energy uh, we are considering a mass element and contribution to kinetic energy due to this deflection is uh, is taken into account but a section like this for example a section like this would rotate in the deformed configuration and there can be inertia against this kind of rotations so if thickness of the plate increases uh, not only we need to allow for shear deformation but also we need to take into account contribution to uh, kinetic energy from uh, rotary inertia terms so some of these need to be included if you if you wish to develop uh, you know refined theories for plate behavior so the one that we are discussing is the theory that is valid for thin plates <coughs> so these assumptions 4 to 7 listed in the table uh, are known as kirchhoff law assumptions now the straight line normal normal to middle surface before deformation remains straight normal to the middle plane with no change in their lengths after deformation that's what we have been emphasizing if the initial and final position of the points on the middle surface are known the initial and final positions of all points of the plate will be known so this is a consequence of the assumptions that we have made the strain field can be calculated at all points in the plate in terms of the middle surface alone okay uh, in terms of um, the uh, deformation of now the plate problem can be thus tackled as a problem in two dimensions okay so this is what will emerge now as we go through the analysis now in dealing with uh, three dimensional uh, um, elasticity problem we talked about stress and strain components but in engineering theories like actually vibrating rod beams plates etc we talk about stress resultants they are the integrals of stresses across the cross sections of the structure under uh, consideration so in a plate the stress resultants uh, are shown here there will be um, bending moments about x axis twisting moment mxy twisting moment myx uh, bending moment myy and shear force qy and qx so these are the stress resultants in a plate problem so how do you compute uh, how the uh, normal stress and bending moments are related so you integrate across the thickness of the plate as shown here and you get what is bending moments that means sigma xx z dz so you take the moments of the stress up about the middle plane and you get this similarly myy in this on, on this face we get this mxy is uh, because of shearing stresses we get this shear force again because of shearing stresses and they are integrals over the surface so these are quantities per unit length <coughs> now let's again uh, examine some of the implications in terms of uh, our ability to formulate the problem now because we have made these assumptions what happens to the uh, displacement stress and strain fields now plane sections initially normal to the middle plane remain plane the consequence of that is epsilon xz xyz is only function of epsilon uh, x and y the dependence on z is uh, not there and similarly epsilon yz is function of x and y only it remains plane and normal to the middle plane that means the shearing strains are zero if you make only this assumption the shearing strains are independent of z 
here you are going ahead and telling that it also remains normal to the middle plane therefore this is 0 and we will have the same length would mean epsilon zz is 0 that means the thickness of the plate does not change uh, epsilon zz is therefore 0. Now epsilon zz equal to 0 means dou w by dou z is 0 that means w of x y z is independent of z and it is w of x comma y. So it is enough if we study this at the middle plane that is what we will do. Now you consider epsilon zz based on the constitutive law uh, epsilon zz is given by this. Now we are assuming that epsilon zz is 0 but actually this may not be true that is uh, epsilon zz equal to 0 need not imply that sigma zz is equal to this okay. So we abandon this constitutive law in our formulation we will not really use this constitutive law. Now you look at now epsilon xz is 0 the shearing strains are 0 that means dou w by dou x plus dou u by dou z equal to 0 consequently it means u of x y z is minus z dou w by dou x. Similarly epsilon y z is 0 implies that v is minus z dou w by dou y. So I am basically able to express u and v in terms of w. Now epsilon x z equal to 0 means sigma x z must be 0. Similarly epsilon y z equal to 0 means sigma y z must be equal to 0 but this cannot be true since we want these stresses to be not equal to 0 so that the corresponding stress resultants are not 0. If, the, if we uh, take these constitutive laws to be valid the implication is that shearing stresses will be 0 and the, therefore the stress resultants uh, are also 0. Now this is not true so what we do is we will abandon these two constitutive laws in our formulation. Now <coughs> next we are assuming that sigma zz sigma xx is much larger than sigma zz and sigma xx uh, yy is, is also much larger than sigma zz. So we can neglect sigma zz in the formulation of constitutive laws. So we will write epsilon xx actually it is given by this now we will knock off this term and retain only this. Similarly epsilon yy when I write I will use this then shearing strain is given by this okay. Uh, the remaining constitutive laws are already abandoned there are only three constitutive laws which we will be using with this simplification. Now therefore the constitutive law for a thin plate theory is uh, having these components sigma xx, sigma yy, sigma xy given by this. Now if you uh, uh, go back and check with the uh, constitutive law that we use for plane stress elements it turns out that the constitutive law that is emerging here is identical to what was used in plane stress theory. But you should be careful uh, you should not interpret bending of a plate as a problem in plane stress there are many variation points for example uh, sigma xx, sigma yy, xy, xz, sigma yz need to be non-zero in a plate bending problem and functions of x, y and z this is not true in a plane stress problem. The only point of commonality is that the relationship between stresses and strains uh, that is these th strains and uh, the, the three corresponding stresses uh, is identical to what was seen in a plane stress model. <coughs> now we now need to compute the uh, strain energies and kinetic energy so that is where we are now moving towards. So we have now u is given by minus z dou w by dou x v is given by minus z dou w by dou y epsilon xx now I can express in terms of w it is minus z dou square w by dou x square epsilon yy minus z dou square w by dou y square sharing strain is minus 2z dou square w dou x dou y. So we write now the strain in terms of this curvature curvatures are rate of change of slopes uh, dou square w dou x square dou square w dou y square and this dou square w dou x dou y and we define epsilon as minus z into chi where chi is the vector of curvatures as defined here. Now sigma is d into epsilon and d is this matrix so we are now ready to write the expression for strain energy and kinetic energy. The strain energy is given by sigma transpose epsilon dv0 and in terms of using this constitutive law it is epsilon d epsilon dv0. Now I will use this now for this and write uh, for epsilon minus z chi and I will be able to write uh, integrate over the depth uh, and uh, that leads to uh, this term h cube by 12 and the remaining terms are chi transpose d chi da this is the kinetic uh, uh, strain energy the kinetic energy is half rho h w dot square dA as I already mentioned uh, we are including only this contribution to kinetic energy from only W. 
Now, we need we can now consider the problem of formulating a finite element uh, for analyzing plate structures. So, we will start with considering a thin rectangular element with 4 nodes with 3 degrees of freedom per node and there are 12 degrees of freedom. The field variable is W of x y comma t. The order of the highest derivative present in the Lagrangian is 2. See the, the uh, chi transpose d chi is there chi itself has dou square w by dou x square the highest order of derivative of the field variable is 2. <coughs> so, the degrees of freedom should be it should include derivatives up to 2 minus 1. So, uh, there are now uh, 2 special variables therefore, de, any, at any node the degree of freedom will be w dou w by dou x and dou w by dou y. Since there are uh, uh, 4 nodes with each node having 3 degrees of freedom the number of generalized coordinates in our representation must be 12. So, these are the broad features that we can deduce before we embark upon developing the model. So, the geometry of the model uh, this is rectangular plate uh, these are the axis x y z and I introduce x by a uh, as x i and y by b as eta and th those coordinates are also shown here this is eta and uh, x i and this is z coordinate along z we need not make any transformation this w is shown as a corresponding displacement here. Now, uh, theta uh, x is the twist about x axis theta y is the twist about y axis and theta z is the twist about z axis. 1, 2, 3, 4 are the nodes uh, and we will now write the expressions for energies in such an element. Now, the displacement field within uh, this element what is the displacement field? This is W of x y comma t this has to be now uh, written in terms of nodal values of the field variables which should be the degrees of freedom should be w dou w by dou x dou w by dou y. So, there are 3 nodal coordinates here uh, degrees of freedom here. So, the w need to be represented in terms of these 12 uh, nodal uh, uh, you know uh, displacement values. So, how do we uh, represent that? So, we will start with this is a Pascal's triangle we need 12 terms from this. So, I will start with 1 x y x square x y y square then uh, x cube x square y x y square y cube. When I reach this stage I have exhausted 10 terms I have to pick 2 more terms now. So, 2 more terms uh, in this what we do is we select this term and this term ok. So, if I select this then I will not be able to I have to select one more term. Uh, then uh, I will not be able to honor the requirements of uh, geometric invariance. That means, if I were to change the nomenclature of x and y axis the representation of w will change because suppose if I retain this and retain any other element it is not symmetric in x and y. So, this is why we take these two. So, this is the representation that we can think of. Now, the steps for formulating the stiffness and mass matrices are quite similar to what we have done conceptually. But the questions we should now ask is uh, is this element a conforming element ok. So, by that I mean are the quantities w dou w by dou x and dou w by dou y are continuous across the plate uh, element boundaries. So, it turns out that this element will not be a conforming element. So, we will just see the, uh, some of the details now. So, I will now I will have to select now uh, these 12 generalized coordinates. Uh, so, I will write uh, now I will write this uh, w in terms of x i and eta and this is expression there is a slight abuse of notation these alpha 1 to alpha 12 are not necessarily this this is in x y coordinates uh, this is in uh, uh, x i eta coordinate but it is all right because I am not going to use this representation uh, further this is to explain the concept I have used this. Now, this can be put in a matrix form uh, as shown here alpha is a vector of alpha 1 alpha 2 to alpha 12 and if I multiply this I get this function this I call it as p into alpha. Now, I need to represent w dou w by dou x i and dou w by dou eta. So, I can differentiate this to get uh, dou w by dou x i uh, I get this you can quickly see that 1 is 0 psi is 1 eta is 0 this is 2 psi etcetera etcetera. Similarly, dou w by dou eta is this that means I am differentiating this with respect to eta first two terms are 0 next is 1 0 x i 2 eta so on and so forth. Now, 
<coughs> we, there are now 12 unknowns, but we know the value of w dou w by dou psi and dou w by dou eta at the 4 nodes that is x i equal to plus minus 1 and eta equal to plus minus 1. So, there are 12 equations and 12 unknowns. So, I can uh, write this expression that means I can relate the nodal the vector of nodal uh, displacements to these generalized coordinates alpha through a matrix which enforces these conditions. So, if we do that I will now call the uh, nodal degrees of freedom uh, uh, in terms of since I am introducing now uh, x i and eta coordinates uh, it will be like this ok. Now <coughs> w 1 b into theta x 1 theta y 1 is node 1 this is at node 2, node 3, node 4. This A E matrix you can show that it turns out to be this I mean it is a matter of uh, simple coding you can verify this. So, now alpha itself can be computed subsequently as A E inverse into W. So, now W is given by this P into alpha now this alpha is given in by A E inverse into W E. So, with this uh, I will be able to now write uh, W E uh, which is this vector in terms of uh, this the um, product uh, the, uh, this into A E inverse and that I have given this name as N 1, N 2, N 3, N 4 uh, each one here is a uh, 1 row and 3 element matrix. So, the transpose of that is shown here. So, uh, this can be uh, you know verified this requires some effort uh, this can be verified uh, that you will get this. The symbolic uh, 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 you know uh, uh, softwares can be used to uh, you know code this up and verify. <coughs> now, I raise this question of uh, uh, whether the element is conforming or not. So, how do we verify that? So, now let us consider the edge 2 3 uh, that is x i equal to 1 ok. Now, along this edge now I will compute w theta x and theta y and see if the if I were to add one more element here. Uh, what happens to these quantities across the edge 2 3. So, if you recall if these quantities theta x w and theta y depend only on nodal coordinates at 2 and 3 then adding one more element will retain the continuity of these functions across this edge. But if the value of any of these variables also depend on values of these coordinates then if you add one more element here there would not be a continuity here because when I take a point on this uh, edge and view it as a member of this element it is influenced by 1 and 4. Similarly, the point on this edge uh, considered as a member of the neighboring element which I am going to add uh, will depend on other two nodes which are outside this. So, consequently there will be lack of uh, continuity of the uh, field variable across the edge. So, now the question is is that condition satisfied or not this is something that we need to verify. So, what we do is we will consider now uh, the edge x i equal to 1 and these functions n j transpose j equal to 1 2 3 4 uh, j is the uh, nodal coordinates it is x j and eta j that you are finding are the coordinates for the jth node. So, now if by putting j equal to 1 2 3 and 4 I can get these 4 functions and we using x i equal to 1 this is on this side. So, it is a simpler version of this these uh, uh, quantities. Now, using that for w along this edge I can write uh, the expression w 2 into this beta theta x 2 into this w 3 and beta theta x 3 I get this function. So, now based on this you can see that uh, w depends on nodal values of w 2 w 3 and theta x 2 and theta x 3 that means it is basically uh, depending on w representation for w along x i equal to 1 depends on two values of degrees of freedom at 2 and 3. So, consequently we can conclude that uh, w depends on nodal values of this and similarly we can also show theta x also depends only on these nodal coordinates. So, it, uh, it uh, emerges that w and theta x will be continuous across the edge 2 3 if another element were to be attached along this edge. So, there is no problem as far as w and theta x are concerned, but how about theta y. Now, theta y is given by minus 1 by a dou w by dou x i and we have to evaluate this. So, this requires some calculations. So, uh, if I now use uh, this representation for x i equal to 1 and differentiate with respect to x i I get these functions and based on that along this edge I need these 4 quantities I do this 
and if you now carefully examine these expressions and you look at theta y along x i equal to 1 it, uh, it turns out that its value depends upon uh, w and theta x at nodes 1, 2, 3 and 4 in addition to of course values of theta y at nodes 2 and 3 okay that means it is influenced by w and theta x also. So consequently it, uh, it, it so happens that um, uh, it violates the condition that for theta y to be continuous between elements it should depend uh, upon nodal displacements at uh, nodes 2 and 3. So that means this element is not a conforming element. This element is named as ACM element after the uh, scientist who formulated this element. Uh, it is still being used uh, therefore in spite of this uh, apparent undesirable feature the element is still used therefore we can go ahead and formulate the matrices. So we will see the consequence of that uh, in the next class. So at this juncture uh, we will close this lecture in the next lecture what we will see is we will complete this formulation and derive the mass and stiffness matrices and then let us examine uh, how to develop a conforming element. So one idea would be to use uh, products of beam trial functions in the two directions. We have used the uh, uh, cubic polynomials for uh, analyzing beams. So if you assume that plate is made up of two uh, you know beams which are orthogonal to each other then we can utilize the uh, products of uh, uh, beam functions that uh, the shape function that we use for the beams and uh, we can develop an element and let us see uh, how that happens uh, in the next class. We will conclude this lecture at this stage. Thank <laughs> you.